Welcome to episode 38, How Many Hours a Day Do You Work? Welcome to the Ease of Hustle. I'm Lauren Cash. I'm a master certified coach, calendar queen, and multiple six-figure digital business owner. I adore helping you create goals your mind never thought were an option by blending together spirituality, mindset coaching, minimalism, and psychology. If you're looking to go from procrastinating perfectionist to easeful entrepreneur, this is the podcast that is meant for you. Thanks for being here. Now let's get to the show. How is your Monday? Are you having an amazing day? You better make it one. I have been recently drinking more of my cacao. Shout out to Sarah and the podcast that I talked about, Specific Manifestations. It's kind of like drinking hot chocolate without being too intensely hot chocolate-ish. It's kind of fun, but I feel like as soon as the weather is even hotter. And by the time this episode comes out, it will be very hot. I probably will need to figure out an iced situation that I enjoy a lot more. So I will probably be sharing whatever I'm drinking on Instagram because I can't help it but post lots of photos of my beverages. (laughs) So Enough about me and my beverages. Actually, we're going to still talk about me more today because I love getting all of the questions that you have for me to answer on the podcast and episode requests. So keep them coming. Thank you for those invitations to share. The link will be in the show notes for a form for you to be able to fill out to keep them in queue for me. So much more fun when I feel like we're having a back and forth conversation rather than me just talking at you, hoping something will land or speak to you out of thin air. So today I'm going to answer a series of questions I got that are quicker to answer more rapid fire. So let's get to it, shall we? Why do you like the number 11? The number 11 has a lot of significance for me and my family, actually. Before I knew anything about angel numbers or align numbers or anything like that, when I was going into high school, my parents were praying about if they should stay in Illinois, where we were living at the time, or if they were meant to move back to California. I moved around a lot growing up and I don't know fully what was happening at the time in my parents' lives, but I did know that my dad had gone on a trip to California and was really praying about it. He was in the desert where I actually ended up going to high school, so you know what happened (laughs) in this story. And he asked for a sign, I think, from God about if they were meant to move back to California, and that sign was the number 11, and he started seeing it everywhere. I probably should ask him to tell me the story again because I don't even think I have all of the details down, but he saw 11 everywhere and really felt like God was calling them back to California. So we moved back to California for my high school years, and my dad had decided that his commitment to me and my brother would be to keep us in the same high school for the whole entirety of our high school experience because he had had the experience of going to four different high schools when he was obviously in high school. So I really appreciated that from my dad. Growing up, moving around a lot didn't impact me as much school-wise because I had been homeschooled until eighth grade. Fun fact, if you didn't know that about me. But I was in public school starting in eighth grade. So then in high school, we were in Palm Desert by Palm Springs in Southern California. And I was there all four years. And the reason why I was there was because of the number 11. And so now it's always been something that we sort of point out to each other. Whenever we see the number 11, it just means to me that I'm on the path that God, universe, source wants me on. It's like in alignment. Like I am where I need to be. That's what it means to me is I'm where I need to be. I'm on track. Here I am. And like being reassured of God, universe, source's presence, if you will. So that's why I like the number 11. And I also just like a lot of aligned angel numbers too, which you'll notice everything in the shop is priced after like a fun number like that. 
And a lot of us in the coaching industry like those fun angel aligned numbers as well. Next question is how many hours a day do you work? This is such an interesting question for me and I struggle with how to answer it because there's so many different factors about how many hours a day one works. First question I always ask is, well, what do you count as work? What is work? Because some people count like almost everything I do all day, every day, work, like including reading books, including studying new certifications, things like that, that for me are just almost my hobbies, but I guess could be classified as work in some way. Listening to podcasts, researching, thinking about my clients, going on walks, doing deep work on myself, all of this. But I really consider work more of the output of my energy more draining of energy work, things that maybe if I had another choice, I might not necessarily want to do or what I would need to take off to like take a vacation. So a lot of times for me, especially as a projector, according to human design, a lot of my energy management is around like live things. That's what I call them, quote unquote, live things. So Meetings with people, although meetings with like my internal team are not as draining necessarily as like doing client sessions. Not that client sessions are draining in a bad way. It just that is definitely work. And I love that work that I get to do though. I absolutely love what I do. So that's what's so hard about how many hours a day do I work as well. So looking at live things, I've been consciously trimming back recently how many live things a day. So maybe webinars, groups that I'm coaching, classes that I'm teaching for certification, Instagram lives, meetings with people, sessions with clients, like all of these live types of things. I am working on honing that down to be a maximum of three hours a day sometimes four. If I'm more in a certain place in my feminine cycle, I can handle a little bit more. Right now, I'm actually in that place in my cycle where I can handle a little bit more, but three or four hours maximum because I always want to make sure that I have on non-Mondays And I'm playing with the Fridays, how I'm handling that too. But like the core days of the week, the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I want to at least have two hours of deep work time. So time where I'm recording podcasts like these, I'm writing podcasts, I'm writing emails for you all. I'm designing program delivery. I'm doing all the deep work that is undistracted. And that's really Cal Newport's word is deep work, term, not word. So if you haven't read that book, I highly recommend it. If you've heard of Focus Time in Monday Hour One, it's really based off of this concept of deep work. And I want to make sure I always am still maintaining deep work in my day. And then I also always need time for slacking with my team, slacking with my clients or between session support with clients and all sorts of how to manage a company. There's so much time that goes to that that a lot of us don't even realize how much time goes to just being CEO of your own company. There's a lot of other things happening, not just me doing the like content creator role or the coaching role. So right now I would say I probably am averaging more like six or seven hours a day. I had been at like eight, nine, I think for a while. So I've cut down. And then I also am working towards when I'm on my period, having way, way less than that. So I would really like to get that down to like two to four hours a day during my period when I'm bleeding so that I can rest. And I am also working on honing my work down further on the other weeks, but I also don't want to do it in such a way that my mind gets super stressed out. 
about really counting the hours and getting into perfectionism of not doing a good enough job of working less. Like I really find that my mind does that (laughs) very quickly whenever I am intentionally honing my work down. And I also just, there are a lot of things I love doing in my business. So I want to make sure that I'm not counting that sort of against this perfect number that I'm attempting to work. So I do want to get to a place though where the amount of hours that I'm working is something that I feel really good about and can manage my energy with because I don't think I've talked about this really on the podcast yet and I want to talk about it more at some point. I got diagnosed with adrenal fatigue towards the end of last year and I've been working on healing that and I also have been working with playing with this projector experiment and projectors are really meant to work way less than the rest of the collective and rest way more. And I do want that in some aspects. And in some aspects, I also want to work and create and manage my team and all of that. So I'm playing with what is that experiment? What is the balance? And playing with also like a cyclical business. This has been something that I think will be really fun to play with. Next year, I would love for my team to be able to have three-day weekends for the whole summer. I think that would be really amazing. And to have more of our work during the cold months for some of the country or some of the areas of the world. And then during the warm months, really being able to get outside and travel and have less of a workload in the summer if you have kids, stuff like that. I think it would be really nice to have a cyclical workflow in the company. So I'm playing with a lot of this and always experimenting. I would love to keep sharing with all of you what unfolds as we get even more effective with our work and make things even more automated, systematic, and really stay focused on what truly matters in the business and not just doing, you know, copy and pasting and creating documents just to create documents. (laughs) I know none of us think that we are, but sometimes it's just like, what are you doing? All right. The next question is, tell us about your boyfriend. What does he do? How long have you been together? So my boyfriend is actually one of my employees. So he started working for me at the end of 2020. We met last May. So coronavirus love story. We met on an app called Hinge and we went on our first date in coronavirus times. And we were trying to figure out how we were going to do that. And if we felt safe, we had both been being super careful. I had been like super hyper vigilant and wasn't doing anything, seeing anyone, but I just decided to take a risk and meet up with him. And so we met up. I don't, did we have masks on? I don't even remember, but we risked it for (laughs) getting to know each other. And we hit it off super quickly and have had such a great relationship ever since. So at the time of this recording, we will have been dating for just over a year. So that's super fun. And he supports our business, the business, our meaning like the collective R and like the teams are. <laughs> but he does program management, helping, assisting me in creating our new app that's up. He worked on that project and owned that. And he also worked on helping us get all of the content for the shop all set up with our web developer and really works behind the scenes and making sure all of our programs are delivered well and that the project management is happening in the platform that we use called ClickUp for the delivery of everything. So I'm super grateful for all of his support and can't wait to see what else unfolds for us. But right now we have a long distance relationship. He still lives in California and I live in Nevada, which the next question is, why'd you move to Nevada? So we might as well answer that right now too. So I decided to move to Nevada because, well, I had lived in Texas for a little while and I knew that I didn't want to live in California, but 
I didn't want to stay in Texas at that time either because of some things that were happening in my life. So I just had decided to kind of return home to California while I relaunched my practice and figured out what I was doing with my life. And at the time I was dating someone else that was in California. And so I kind of was thinking maybe we were going to be living in California and I had to make the sacrifice of (laughs) living in California for that. But I really didn't want to live in California, even though I love the beach. I love that my family is in Southern California and all of that. So as the pandemic happened, then I was trying to figure out, well, where am I going to go next? And I did rent an apartment near my parents after living in my grandma's condo, which I'm super grateful for last year. But then my business was doing really well. And the more money my business was making, the more I wanted to move to a state that would be more supportive of a small business. So I was trying to figure out where that would be when also being in a pandemic environment. And that means I wanted to be still driving distance, not flying distance from my parents and from my boyfriend. And of course, at the time, I didn't know for sure if we were going to stay together or not, but I still wanted to factor that in. So the best place that I could find to be able to drive and not fly to Southern California really was Nevada. And then in Nevada, the best place would be in the Vegas area to be able to drive back and forth between Southern California and where I would move to. So I came out here, scoped it out and found a neighborhood I really enjoyed and liked and felt like home to me because I went to high school in Palm Desert, like I said earlier the desert has always felt very much like home to me, but nowhere has ever really felt like home to me because I've moved around so much. But one place that definitely does feel more like home to me is the desert, especially the Palm Desert in the Coachella Valley. Like that does feel like home to me. So it kind of reminds me of that being in the Vegas area. So That's why I moved to Nevada and my boyfriend and I are doing long distance and thankfully he's been super generous to drive out here a lot and stay with me for periods of time. And I am going out there, like I said, I think a few episodes ago, I'm going to be in Southern California for like a month in June, staying at an Airbnb to be able to be close to him, but also to enjoy the beach in summertime because that's always been a dream of mine to be super close to the beach during the summer. And then I was thinking this morning even how amazing it would be for next summer to be by the beach for the whole summer. So like have the team do the like four-day work weeks with three-day weekends and then spend the whole summer by the beach. I would love for that to be a thing. (laughs) So anyway, that's why I moved to Nevada. Next question is, do you have any secret hobbies? So I don't think I have a secret hobby. All of my hobbies are very related to my career. So I like read a lot of books that are very related to coaching, productivity, psychology, money, financial independence, like all of those types of things. I read some novels here and there. It's not really a secret hobby. I go on walks slash sort of pseudo hikes sometimes. I love to go on walks twice a day if I can. That's not really a secret hobby. Watching YouTube videos sometimes. It's not really a hobby either. And then I've been diving into learning human design which is kind of not really a hobby either. So I'm not a really great hobbyist, but oh, I was talking about recently that I used to create collages on bulletin boards as a kid and I want to get back into that. So maybe collaging will be a new not so secret hobby. Yeah, just my business and my day-to-day life, I guess I would say keep me pretty entertained and yeah, I don't really have any secret hobbies. Maybe that's boring, but I love my life the way that it is. The next question is, how do you stay out of the pool with clients? 
So for those of you who are not certified coaches through the Life Coach School, you might not know what staying out of the pool means. So I'll just tell you briefly what we mean by that so you're not completely confused listening to this question. So at the Life Coach School, we learn how to hold the space and not believe a client's story. So basically, this person's asking me, like, how do I not believe the client's stories when I'm coaching my clients? How do I stay super clean and not swim around with their maybe limiting beliefs (laughs) is how we could put it. I always am asking myself, like, what are the facts here? What do we actually know? And I stay super curious. So staying really curious, asking myself, what are the facts? And then just staying in this posture of like, I just don't believe what's happening is the way that they think that it's happening. Like there's something going on here that we haven't quite uncovered. So what are the facts and what is the story and really separating out the two And I think it just comes with a lot of practice, coaching lots of clients. And then one thing that I see when I'm mentoring or teaching coaches, the reason why they end up getting in the pool is, well, actually there's two things that are coming to my mind. One is they haven't done a lot of their own work yet. They haven't gotten coached a lot themselves. They haven't done enough self-coaching to really have separated out and looked at what are thoughts and what are facts and seen the difference in many scenarios. And then the second thing is that they think that they're relating to the client. So I'll hear coaches say like, their story was just so familiar to me. I've gone through the exact same thing. And the truth is we never as coaches could have gone through the exact same thing as a client, even if it is very similar, it can't be the exact same. Our lived experience will never be the same as somebody else's lived experience. It was a different day of the week, a different person they were interacting with, a different moment in their lifetime. Not everything would be the same. Like the weather was different. (laughs) The clocks had a different, like there were a lot of other factors that were very different. And even their internal experience will never be the exact same as yours. So I think that belief and always knowing, even if it sounds similar to what I might think that I'm going through, it's totally different. So reminding myself, I actually don't know what's going on here is the best reminder. Because I I like to know like what's going on and I like to think that I'm super smart and know exactly what's going on. That's something I've had a lot of feedback on in my coaching is like I'm assuming I'm jumping ahead. I'm not curious enough. So I continue to work on my curiosity and not believing I have it all figured out. I can kind of be a know-it-all, which is kind of (laughs) projector energy. We think we have everything figured out, which... We think we have the other all figured out in that way. And we might, but we might not. So staying in that energy of, I probably don't know what's going on here. Let's be curious really helps me. All right. You still with me? (laughs) We have two more questions. One is, do you have kids? You mentioned kids in the Monday Hour One video. So if you haven't taken Monday Hour One, that is a Coach Tank project I had the honor of doing with Brooke Castillo and Tyson Bradley with the Life Coach School. We'll have the link in the show notes if you want to check that out. But a lot of you probably already know me from that. I do not have kids. I don't. But the reason why I acted as if I did in Monday Hour One was because I thought it would be way more relatable for a lot more people. If I just did my schedule as a single person without kids, I didn't think it would be as relatable. And I've coached so many clients with kids that I felt like that would be so much more useful for folks. So That's why I acted as if I had kids in that video. And I also wanted you to know, like, it doesn't even matter if you have kids, you can still use the system and you can still use the system and have kids. I've coached a lot of people with them. You might just need additional help from a coach for how to think about it, maybe slightly differently than like 
the rigid rules. So if you want help with that too, definitely come join us in Cultivate Margin. All right. The last question is, what is the best advice you've ever received? Oh my gosh. I keep looking at this question and wondering what is the best advice I've ever received? (sighs) I don't even know if it's advice. I probably have received the best questions before from coaches rather than advice. Maybe that's my answer is like the best advice isn't advice. It's just a question and getting asked the best questions by amazing coaches have changed my life. And I can't even think of like which one, because I've had so many powerful coaching experiences at this point that have completely changed my life. And I'm so grateful for them. I hope you can have that experience too. I really do. Being coached by a coach, just, it changes everything. It really does. So I hope that for you. Thank you so much for listening to all these random questions. Thank you for those that submitted them. It's so fun to get them from you all. If you want to submit your own, go to the show notes. The show notes are always at vivere.co and then slash whatever the number is. And this is episode 38. And I hope you have an amazing week. I'll see you next week. Bye. Hey there. Thanks so much for listening. I wanted to invite you if you are ready to integrate what you're learning on this podcast and want to dive deeper, you must come check out Cultivate Margin. It's my coaching program that's a hybrid between a self-study course and a coaching program designed just for you. Join me and the community of others like you at vivere.co forward slash margin. That's V-I-V-E-R-E dot C-O slash margin, M-A-R-G-I-N. And you can get that link in the show notes as well. I can't wait to see you in there. Have an amazing day.